It's been exactly six months since South Korea confirmed its first COVID-19 patient. And back then, the novel coronavirus wasn't yet a global pandemic, but South Korea responded very quickly and within weeks it had plans to develop a test kit and eventually a vaccine. Since then, Korea has built a solid reputation for its medical response to the virus. But can K-Bio go above and beyond expectations, first starting with the development of a vaccine? For this, we connect with Jerome Kim, Director General of the International Vaccine Institute based here in Seoul. Lovely to have you on the programme, sir. Good morning. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. And you? I, I'm very good too. I mean, we're both in Seoul and it's been a bit humid today, but... Hopefully, you know, the things will dry up towards the end of the week. But, well, <laughs> it's been a very exciting month for you, really. It's been very busy for you. Your institute's been involved in uh, several vaccine projects, actually. And your partnership with Inovio and Seoul National University Hospital began human trials last week. And, well, please tell us more about that. How is it looking so far? So we really can't tell at this point. You know, the, the, in a clinical trial, you give the volunteers uh, an injection of the vaccine, and then you need to wait to see if the vaccine is developing the kind of protective or immune responses that, that you really expect a vaccine to do. We're rather confident that the Inovio vaccine will develop some immune responses, protective immune responses, infection-fighting proteins, and, um, and the kinds of uh, killer cells that kill virally infected cells, because we've seen, we've used uh, the Inovio DNAs before with other vaccines, and they appear to be able to generate the right protective responses. So, but we still have to wait. We do the vaccinations, uh, we sample, take samples from the patients, and then we conduct the laboratory tests that will tell us that the vaccine is helping. And also, importantly, that the vaccine is safe. Well, what's the timeline for you, really, um, provided that things do go well? So we should have some information uh, by the end of the summer. Uh, to tell us that the vaccine is safe, that that actually that information actually comes in relatively real time. Uh, the more complicated issue is measuring the laboratory, res me measuring protective responses in the laboratory, because that requires that we do these uh, we call them assays, uh, laboratory tests, in a very very systematic and highly quality controlled manner, and and that actually take does take some time. Well, the South Korean government aims to have a locally produced vaccine out by the second half of 2021. Do you think this is possible? Yes, so I think many people around the world have been using the six to 18 month time frame. And so given where and when uh, Korean companies started working on the vaccine, then the middle of next year seems to be a reasonable target. They may actually have a signal that one of the vaccines is showing some evidence that it can protect and is safe uh, a bit earlier than that. But, you know, with a vaccine, the three key ingredients are first, proving that it works. Second, making it in sufficient quantity and in sufficient quality to be used in humans. And then finally, to actually develop the, the plans uh, to utilize a vaccine. So it's still pretty early days on the first step, proving that it works. Uh, and then we still have to make it and then develop the plans for use. Well, the Korean government's been uh, rolling out a couple of measures to help scientists develop a vaccine. For example, the uh, fast track uh, approval process for scientists, for example, as well as you know, providing funding, of course. Do you think these efforts have been sufficient? I mean, how do you assess the South Korean government's support for uh, local researchers in developing a vaccine? So, you know, being one of the advanced economies, um, the Korean government is um, taking a very forward position in providing funding for companies. Uh, to develop vaccines for use in Korea. But, you know, companies are also uh, making arrangements uh, with outside firms uh, that will allow them to do what we call contract manufacturing of, of different vaccines from around the world. So, as in the United States or as in uh, several countries in Europe, Korea is, is doing much the same. Using its technological edge here, the, the biotechnology industry, to try and create Korean vaccines. Um, accelerating development by providing a, a useful, uh, very helpful working environment for the development of a COVID vaccine. And then finally, ensuring that Korean manufacturers are participating in the global effort to potentially provide adequate amounts of vaccine should one be shown to be effective. So at multiple levels, the Korean government is um, taking an approach to try to uh, maximize the opportunity for, I think, the Korean people to have access to a vaccine when and if one is shown to be effective. 
Well, what unique challenges do South Korea-based firms and researchers face in developing a vaccine here? I mean, do regulations on patient data or uh, biospecimens hinder the process, for example? No, actually, I think that the you know, Korean firms are starting a little bit behind some of the other firms in the West and in China. Uh, many of those or several of those firms are in the last stage of testing, the stage where you actually can tell whether a vaccine protects against infection and disease. We call that phase three. A number of other major companies are in phase two, which is where you're really looking to see whether the vaccine is um, developing the right protective responses in the population you want to vaccinate. The Korean companies that are involved now are in phase one, the earliest stage of testing, where we're looking really at safety, or they're in animal testing. So we call that preclinical. And so the Korean companies are a little bit behind. But in the end, it's showing that the vaccine works in a population that has disease. So Korean companies will have to go outside of Korea in order to test their vaccines. And that's a, actually a rather unique challenge. American companies can test their vaccines in the United States because of the large number of COVID-19 infections there. Korean companies will have to do the final phase three testing outside of Korea in a country with um, more substantial burden, such as Brazil, South, South Africa, the United States. Oh, well, ensuring the safety and efficacy of vaccines, of course, is um, probably the most important aspect, right? But in regards to vaccines, some studies say that they may be effective for only two to three months. Why is this the case? So that's actually a really important and very interesting question. They actually haven't shown that yet for vaccines. What they are basing that um, assumption on is the idea that when they look at people who've had COVID-19 infection and they look at the amount of uh, infection fighting protein in their blood, we call them antibodies. The amount of neutralizing antibody in the blood of a COVID-19 patient tends to be rather low, much lower than we'd expect. And several studies have suggested that that antibody disappears rather rapidly. In a way, it's very similar to what we see with other coronaviruses. So not the COVID-19 virus per se, but, but its cousins. Uh, and so people are saying, well, maybe if we use a vaccine, the vaccine will behave the same way, that the protective immune responses will disappear very quickly. We actually don't know the answer to that question. And I think the other part of this is, you know, vaccines are a little bit different from, from infection. We try to mimic uh, what natural infection does in terms of generating those protective um, proteins, antibodies, and the kinds of cells that kill virus uh, it, that is infected cells. And we're trying to do that, but we can tweak the vaccine in other ways that may be able to make better protective immune responses and immune responses in particular that last longer. But it's still, again, too early to tell. And we really need to look at those protective responses to see how long they last in people who've received the vaccine. Well, there are more than 100 research efforts um, you know, moving towards this vaccine development. And now this na um, vaccine nationalism is becoming a source of quite a substantial source of concern. Do you think this could actually develop into something a bit more consequential than a little bit of harmless rivalry? It is regrettable. Uh, we really should be working um, worldwide to develop a coronavirus vaccine that works for everybody uh, and is available to everybody. So I think your, your point is a very good one. There are some groups that are working very hard right now uh, in order to set up a framework so that people around the world can have access to whatever vaccine is shown to be safe and effective. So that would include an organization called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, uh, which actually Korea has recently joined, the World Health Organization, and an organization known as GAVI, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Gavi's role is actually really critical because Gavi purchases vaccines for low and middle income countries at a re and provides it to them either free or at a greatly reduced rate. What these three organizations is, are now trying to do is get global agreement on a mechanism uh, for countries to have access to a certain amount of vaccine to vaccinate at least initially the groups in, the, in that country that need it the most, the elderly, healthcare workers and others. Um, so there is an ongoing global effort. And I think, you know, if we can, everyone needs to get behind this idea that really there needs to be a mechanism that provides countries around the world access to vaccine, in particular when supplies are limited. Well, it's definitely very encouraging to hear that there are global mechanisms out there that um, 
countries are working on and also acronyms as well. <laughs> but, well, there are fears yeah, that um, there are also fears uh, related to vaccine nationalism that uh, cyber attacks may be launched to steal information. Is this a genuine concern that scientists are dealing with now? So I think anything that breaches the security of a computer network uh, is, is very important. You know, research organizations store incredible amounts of information uh, and also information about uh, operating procedures and laboratory assays and, and confidential data. And it is really important for organizations, you know, like IVI, but for major companies as well, uh, to have secure systems. And so I think that Unfortunately, these cyber attacks did occur. Um, I know that there have been a lot of accusations. So I think that as a whole, we all need to be very careful and ensure that our computer systems are safe and keep out unwanted uh, cyber hackers or people who are trying to get information. But you're, yes, you're right. I mean, this is something that is going on and it's a part of, I guess, industrial espionage that occurs um, all the time, all over the world. It's just, you know, with all the pressure of COVID, um, countries and, and people are, are, be, are resorting to tactics that, that aren't those that we normally see in medical research. Well, right now, the University of Oxford and uh, US bio company Moderna seem to be, uh, I suppose, the ones uh, in, the in the front of the race, I suppose. And um, they're both in phase three of their clinical trials. And well, especially with uh, Moderna having claimed success in triggering an immune response from their uh, patients or their, uh, in, in their clinical trials. But there, of course, has been some scepticism over their findings. What do you think needs to be verified before we can all be optimistic about this? Great question. You know, there, there are many people in the lead at this point. Um, a Chinese company named Sinovac is also in phase three. And we often um, don't talk about uh, where the Chinese companies are uh, in terms of the global race for a coronavirus 19 uh, vaccine. Um, I think with Moderna, uh, as with many companies, um, the temptation to release information um, in a press release at an investors conference uh, was substantial, but their data actually has now been published. And the immune responses, the protective responses that the RNA vaccines generate are hopeful. It generates infection fighting proteins uh, called antibodies uh, that appear to be able to neutralize the virus, which is exactly what you want a vaccine to do. And it also develops the correct kind of, uh, we say, T cell responses, the kind of cells that, that may go after the virus. Um, so from that perspective, once the data was published, Moderna did have a product that looked hopeful. So that's great news. Um, Sinovac has similar data uh, in humans and, uh, and, and sorry, in, in terms of protection of, of non-human primates, of monkeys uh, from infections. So, um, and uh, of course the Oxford group does as well. So, you know, right now we have a number of companies in phase three, but we also have a significant number of com com companies wanting to enter phase three or planning to enter phase three shortly. So um, the, this, I guess, the, for lack of a better word, the race is heating up. It's important that these companies test their vaccines carefully because in the end, we want vaccines that meet a very high standard for proof against that the vaccine protects against infection and disease, and also that shows that the vaccine is safe. And those are the two things that we have to worry about when we're evaluating vaccines. Well, as you said, the uh, race is heating up, but once one of the companies or one of the research, uh, research efforts crosses the finish line, how do we ensure that everyone will have access to a vaccine? I mean, firstly, those in developing countries who are already grappling with epidemics and high HIV incidence rates, and also for people without adequate medical coverage as well in countries like the US. Um, how should they be, how can they uh, be ensured access to a vaccine? So that's actually a, a complicated question. But and the, one of the ways to think about it is um, internationally, there is this effort to establish a framework for access that will allow countries around the world, regardless of whether they are high income countries like Korea, uh, middle income countries like countries in Southeast Asia or low income countries as countries in Africa, that everyone will have access to vaccine when it's available in organizations like CEPI, which plan to have 2 billion doses of vaccine ready by the end of 2021, will be instrumental in ensuring that that vaccine gets out to everyone. Other countries, particularly wealthier countries like the United States and several countries in Europe, 
have been purchasing or, or getting order, placing orders for vaccines in anticipation that the vaccines will work. And the United States has actually started to manufacture some of these vaccines, not knowing that they work, but in order to have hundreds of millions of doses ready when the vaccine is shown to work so that it, uh, vaccination of the population can begin immediately. So there are multiple levels. Uh, many of the companies are now going around the world because you know some of the companies are very small. Moderna actually does not have a vaccine licensed. So they'll need to partner with other groups that can make their vaccine. So that process is happening now uh, all over the world. Again, to ensure that when a vaccine is ready, um, there will very shortly thereafter either be doses ready, available, or uh, these doses will be in the stage of manufacturing. So hopefully, once we know, we'll have vaccine. And how has your institute been promoting international cooperation on efforts towards a vaccine? We've been working with organizations like the World Health Organization um, in the calls that will uh, try to develop a common uh, set of rules around how the vaccines are going to be tested. We're also working with CEPI, uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, um, and have submitted additional applications to CEPI to really try to work to internationalize a lot of the research that's going on. So for instance, working with Chinese companies or working with Korean companies to try to get a vaccine out there for testing uh, in as collaborative a uh, means as possible. You know, IVI really at the start of the pandemic decided not to make its own vaccine. We wouldn't want to be one of the 200 or so that are, that are actively now um, under investigation. What we decided instead was to help other groups, companies, research institutes, to do research to accelerate uh, COVID-19 vaccine development. I think that was probably the better approach for us because now we can actually work with multiple different companies at multiple different stages. We can use what IVI does best in order to make sure that we can get to a vaccine as quickly as possible. Well, it's good to see that you're supporting efforts to keep this global race healthy and uh, for public good and for well, global good rather than you know, vaccine supremacy or nationalism. I hope that um, yeah, more countries will be more cooperative in these efforts. And well, I'm afraid we'll have to let you go now, Dr. Kim, but thank you so much for joining the programme. That was Jerome Kim, Director Gen General of the International Vaccine Institute. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Thank you.